Are humans addicted to tanning? Let's talk about it. I'll see you inside. So in today's episode, I do plan to talk about the physiology and biology underpinning tanning. However, I also think that there's no better time to talk about the idea and the concept of humans actually being addicted to UV radiation. And I apologize for loosely throwing around the word addiction, but it does demonstrate what I'm trying to get across. So I'll explain the mechanisms in a moment, but it is actually true that prolonged exposure to UV light will actually increase our production of what's referred to as beta endorphin. And now you may have heard of endorphins before, and a beta endorphin is a molecule produced inside of our body that will naturally reduce our levels of pain and increase our levels and feelings of reward. And now to demonstrate the effect of endorphins, endorphins are actually produced during exercise. And if you've ever entered an exercise session with a subtle pain in your body, and as you began exercising, the pain seemed to actually go away. And this is because our levels of endorphins increase as we continue to exercise, which will have a slight silencing effect on the signals of pain. That doesn't mean that the actual damage has gone away, we simply are not perceiving it at that moment in time. And I'm sure you can imagine the negative implications this could have if we're unknowingly damaging our tissue during exercise because we have high levels of endorphins and we're not perceiving the actual injury taking place. With that being said, the influence of endorphins isn't strong enough to mask something like a muscle tear. But it may mask us actually making a very acute injury a little bit worse during exercise. And the other thing you may know about endorphins is they're actually produced when we take certain substances, such as opioids. And the original use for opioids is as a painkilling medication, and we soon found out that they're actually highly addictive. And this is because they increase our level of beta endorphin. But the other thing that increases our level of endorphins is the topic of this podcast, and that is actually UV radiation that is damaging our DNA. So as I'll discuss in a moment, the process of tanning actually starts with DNA damage. And it is this DNA damage itself that instigates the process in which beta endorphins can eventually be produced. So as scary as it may sound, more DNA damage from tanning may actually make us enjoy the tanning session more. With that being said, let's actually look at the process of tanning. The reason that UV radiation actually increases the pigmentation or darkness of our skin is because it kickstarts the process of producing melanin. And melanin is a dark protein that will give our skin a darker complexion. And it's actually a protective molecule against further UV radiation. So if we take a look at the skin, the outermost layer of skin is mostly made up of a specific cell type called a keratinocyte. And now this is where the melanin that will darken our skin is located, but it's not actually where the melanin is produced. Melanin is actually produced in a cell type that's found normally in a deeper layer of the skin called a melanocyte. And the melanocyte is actually responsible for producing melanin and transferring it to a keratinocyte. And now the initial signal for the melanocyte to begin producing this melanin is actually going to be DNA damage at the keratinocyte that's caused from UV radiation. And now this process is really interesting. So when the DNA of the keratinocyte gets damaged, we get what's referred to as a DNA damage response. And this is simply how the cells know that the DNA in a specific cell has been broken or damaged and needs to be repaired so that we don't begin translating proteins that become harmful. And the mechanism for this is pretty interesting. So when the DNA initially gets damaged, it actually turns on a transcription factor called P53. And what a transcription factor is going to do is it's actually going to enter the DNA and begin encoding for a specific protein. And in this case, it's going to actually encode for a protein called POMC. 
And POMC is a very large protein that is often the initial molecule that is cleaved into different molecules inside of our body. And what I mean by this is POMC begins to get broken down, and every time it gets smaller, it creates a different molecule. In this case, POMC will actually be cleaved into what's referred to as alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. And the reason this is interesting is because through the process of actually producing this alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, we will also produce beta endorphin. And this is because this alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone is simply just a portion of this POMC protein. And when we cleave it off, we actually leave behind a portion that is beta endorphin. So once we actually break up this POMC protein, we're left with one molecule of alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone and another molecule of beta endorphin. And as you may have guessed from the name, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone will increase the activity and stimulate the melanocyte. So it will bind to an MC1R receptor on the actual cell of the melanocyte. And this is what's referred to as a G-protein coupled receptor. And you may have heard me mention this type of receptor when speaking about a different hormone because it's a receptor type that is very common within hormone signaling. Simply, the hormone will bind to the receptor that sits on the outside of the membrane. And on the inside of the membrane, there's a protein that will be released. And in this case, it will activate an enzyme called adenylylcyclase, and this enzyme will turn ATP inside of the neuron into cyclic AMP. And then cyclic AMP will actually turn on the very important protein called protein kinase A. And now this is the protein that actually seems to make all the magic happen. So the way that we really function a lot of the processes in the cell is actually by taking molecules of phosphate and kind of attaching them to different enzymes. And attaching a phosphate to an enzyme either makes it active or inhibits it from being active. And this protein kinase A really works to add these phosphate molecules on to different enzymes. And in this case, it's going to phosphorylate a transcription factor that goes into the DNA and codes for a protein. And this transcription factor actually codes for multiple different proteins. And unfortunately, it is not the melanin itself, which means there's just one more step to remember. So we actually already have a preformed form of melanin stored in specific organelles inside of the melanocyte called melanosomes. And the things that are encoded by this transcription factor are actually the enzymes required to turn this preformed melanin into the actual melanin molecule. And now once we actually have the melanin, the melanocyte will actually fuse to the damaged keratinocyte and allow the melanin to enter the keratinocyte. And what this melanin protein does is it seems to kind of cluster around the damaged DNA. And what the function of melanin actually is, is to absorb UV rays from the sun and actually emit them back out into the environment as heat. Therefore, these rays can't damage the DNA. And this is actually really interesting. So the reason that some people have darker skin is because they have more melanin production at baseline. And it appears that this is a protective adaptation because they lived in environments with extremely high levels of UV radiation from the sun. Therefore, the individuals who had more melanin production at baseline had less DNA damage and were better able to survive in this environment. Therefore, they passed on their genes and the next generation also had the genetics for increased melanin production. And this is simply just the process of natural selection. And now obviously these melanin molecules do not stick around forever, or you'd be able to go get a tan once and stay that pigmentation for the rest of your life. 
So these molecules do naturally degrade. And the process of tanning is simply transiently increasing your melanin production, which will darken your skin pigmentation. And once you stop tanning, the upregulation in melanin production will go back down to normal. And over a period of time, the melanin you produced will degrade and it will be replaced with the natural amount of melanin production that you normally produce. And this is why you need to continue to tan to keep the same skin complexion. So you may think to yourself, if melanin is so protective, why doesn't everyone produce a lot of melanin? And the reason for this seems to be simply the production of vitamin D. So when the skin is exposed to sun, the rays of sunlight are actually used to turn cholesterol into vitamin D. And this is a preformed vitamin D, and the vitamin D will go to the liver, where it forms 25-hydroxyvitamin D. And then this is transported to the kidney, where it is converted into what's typically referred to as the active form of vitamin D, which is 25-dihydroxyvitamin D, or often referred to as colsotriol. And now the implications of vitamin D are many, but that's for a separate discussion. But the production of vitamin D is kickstarted by the absorption of UV rays. And melanin will compete with the cholesterol to absorb these UV rays. Meaning that the more melanin we have, the less likely that the photons are going to be absorbed by cholesterol and the more likely they'll be absorbed by melanin. And evidence for this can simply be seen that people with darker skin complexions have a much more difficult time producing vitamin D from sunlight. They simply have more melanin competing with cholesterol for the absorption of sunlight. And now this is the role of melanocyte stimulating hormone on the skin, but there's actually a role for melanocyte stimulating hormone in the brain. So there actually appear to be two molecules that will stimulate what are referred to as POMC neurons. And these are the neurons that will initially produce the POMC molecule. And these hormones are insulin and leptin. And the eventual byproduct of this is actually a reduction in appetite. And the reason this actually seems to make a little bit of sense is because leptin will actually increase the more body fat we have. And it will decrease when we begin to lose body fat. Therefore, the lower the body fat we have, the less leptin will produce, and the less of this appetite suppressive signal we'll have. And the higher our body fat gets, the more leptin we'll produce, and the more appetite suppression we'll have. And now I talked about when this becomes malfunctioning, when we get leptin resistance, in a different episode, but I'm not going to focus on that today. Initially, insulin is actually a byproduct of having sufficient nutrients inside of our body. And it's going to be produced when we have elevated blood sugar. And elevated blood sugar means that we have nutrients around, therefore there's no reason to stimulate our appetite to go find more nutrients. So the first thing that happens is these hormones bind to a receptor in the hypothalamus that is responsible for producing POMC. And then the POMC gets cleaved into this melanocyte stimulating hormone where it can actually bind to a nearby receptor on another region of the hypothalamus called the paraventricular nucleus. And it will bind to the melanocortin receptor, which is also one of these G proteins. And now the actual events that occur intracellularly for these G protein couple receptors are actually much more complex, but I don't think I'm going to bore you with the details. But it's important to know that eventually we have the production of POMC. And then we actually use this POMC and turn it into melanocyte stimulating hormone in a little organelle referred to as the Golgi apparatus. And then in the Golgi apparatus, it's eventually turned into melanocyte stimulating hormone, which will actually be put into a little vesicle, which will bind to the membrane of the neuron and release this melanocyte stimulating hormone into the synapse. 
which if you remember is the space between two neurons. And the neuron that this melanocyte stimulating hormone eventually binds to is in another region of the hypothalamus called the paraventricular nucleus. And this is yet another G protein coupled receptor. And it goes through the pathway of turning on specific transcription factors. However, the actual transcription factors that it seems to turn on is not quite yet determined. Or at least throughout all the research that I did, I wasn't comfortable saying that there are specific mechanisms that occur in the brain when this melanocyte stimulating hormone binds to the receptor. With that being said, we do know how it affects our behavior. In this case, when this neuron is activated, it will actually reduce our hunger, increase our activity, and it actually seems to increase our resting metabolic rate. And once again, this makes sense because of which hormones actually cause this cascade to occur. Both of these hormones send a signal to the body that we have sufficient nutrients. Therefore, we can decrease our hunger because we don't need to go find more food. We can increase our activity because we have sufficient nutrients around to energize the cell. And we can increase the metabolic processes that are occurring inside of us, which can be helpful for nutrient absorption and a bunch of different metabolic processes that are helpful. And the reason we can do this is once again because we have nutrients around to supply these functions. And on the other hand, if we do studies inhibiting these neurons, the result is weight gain, metabolic issues, and it seems that there's a decreased metabolism. So it appears that the same hormone can actually cause us to both tan and reduce our appetite. And this is actually why bodybuilders who are looking to both increase their skin pigmentation to look better on stage and to reduce their appetite so they can lose more, actually take a specific chemical called melanotan. And I don't think chemical is the right word. I would say solution is the best word. And they inject this solution internally, and they both increase their tan and decrease their appetite. And it's actually because this solution does the exact same thing as the melanocyte stimulating hormone. It is simply melanocyte stimulating hormone in a bottle. And I don't actually have any additional information or takeaways from this fact, but I just thought it was interesting and thought that I would mention it. And with that being said, I'm going to wrap up today's podcast here. So I went in hoping to talk about the biology of tanning, and I ended up talking about how tanning addiction occurs, the actual biology of tanning, and how the same hormone that increases our skin pigmentation can actually help us lose weight and decrease our hunger. So I hope this episode just showed you how absolutely fascinating biology is, and I hope you were entertained. I want to say thank you for listening, and I hope to see you in next episode. Have a great day.